ਦੇ ਥੈਂਕ ਯੂ ਜੀ Good morning guys. Good morning sir. Okay. Um so uh, today we are going to uh, resume our discussion on uh, arima models okay uh, we had discussed a little bit last time when we combined the ar and ma models together into a single model uh, we are going to resume from that point we are going to talk about what we mean by integrated uh, these two models what is the significance of and and how do you uh, not not exactly define stationarity but how do you check for stationarity okay so uh, this is our uh, fifth session i suppose on uh, time series analysis and, and associated ar models uh, ar ma models so uh, today we will try to wrap up the discussions if there are any follow up materials that i ideally would have like to cover but could not cover i post some materials for you you can go through it in your own pace if you have any further queries you can get back to me okay. but this is for your own learning process your evaluation will be dependent on whatever i am i am teaching you in class okay any queries you have at this point of time help up okay so uh, for your in your course web uh, in your moodle i i also have uh, posted the first assignment for this particular course any queries you have regarding that particular assignment uh what table you want to say something so um i i suppose then uh, that assignment is understandable to all of you uh any queries you might be having regarding the material you have covered so far anything from our last class uh yes sir sir one doubt uh while we were discussing about uh what to choose between an ar or an ma model yes part you have any questions uh yes sir am i audible but oh, there's a lag i think i'll write it in the chat box okay fine um so i think we had covered till for choosing lags between the ar and ma models how many lags should we check the acf and psf clause in class we are looking at 10 lags okay uh, so part if you see uh, 
if you see typically how we uh, if you don't define it you will see that in our uh, acf pacf plots okay uh, we have been trying to so in, in your class you are you have been seeing that the acf pacf plots we, we specify specifically to draw it up to lag 10 okay if you don't specify that in that case it, it goes further even uh, possibility lag 30. question is what is the optimal uh, lag that you should test for determining the you know ar and ma model sizes right i i suppose that's your question how many should you be ideally checking is that correct uh yes sir yeah okay so if you find so we are trying as i mentioned in last class what you are trying to essentially do is come up with a model which is parsimonious in a sense which doesn't have too many uh, parameters in the model itself okay so if you find that your acf or pscf your ACF is not cutting off, okay? And you didn't, don't observe something similar for PACF also for 10 lakhs. It doesn't make sense to specify a model which has very high lags in terms of very high order of the model, okay? You coming up with an order 13 AR model is not a parsimonious model per se, okay? If we can transform it somehow, come up with a different form of that uh, particular model whereby it is if the order of the eventual model reduces significantly that would be a better choice okay Got it. so yeah. you can say in, in, in a sense that this this uh, if we test it till model 10 and even then we are not able to come up with a conclusion in terms of the ar and ma so the acf and PSCF plots even after order 10 it's not cutting off. It, there are still significant autocorrelations or partial autocorrelations visible. Then possibly there is some other transformation required to do so. Okay. In the base model itself, it doesn't make sense to specify an AR or an AMA or an ARMA model with very high orders. Okay. Got it. Is, yeah. is, is that does that clarify your uh, so yes, essentially sir. what I'm trying to say is that checking till order 10 or even order 15 is more than enough okay if you if you specify an ar model with order 8 9 10 11 12 though we in, in some cases we have specified an ar model with order 9 uh, but i am i'm not very happy with that specification okay if you can specify with an order 2 or an arma model with ar2 and ma01 i think that i would prefer than having an ARMA model or an AR model or an MA model individually of the order nine or 10. So checking till lag 10 is, is more than enough. It's, it's pretty sufficient. If you want to be more sure, you can extend this uh, in the plots, have, having a look till you know order 15 or 20 or order 30 even. But your choice of the model order should not be impacted by, as such. If you observe that the ACF or the PACF plots are not cutting off, it's not coming off to a, so to say, nice parameter, then look for some transformation of the data that can that can give you so. Okay? Yes, Does sir. that answer your question, Park? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. So I think this is uh, the point till which we had uh, discussed last time, right? The model identification for an ARMA model. Now, though the, the your textbook also, and we also know that the ESCF extended autocorrelation function basically gives you an idea regarding what is the choice of the ARMA model, okay? But unfortunately, there are some problems with it right now. I'll tell you what the problem is. So let me tell you first what the ESCF does, okay? I hope you can see the whiteboard, all of you. Okay. Uh, so just give me a second. Okay. 
So what an ESCF table, ESCF is a sort of a table. What it does is that it tells you in one go the order or the autocorrelations for the AR model. So the default uh, type for or the default specification or the standard specification is ARMA PQ, but P is the order of the AR model and Q is the order of the MA model. Okay, so AR P and MA Q. Here you have it starting from uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Same over here 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We used to have a function ESCF in R which will give you such a table. And that is going to also tell you. Uh, Okay, uh, let me uh, respond to another question I got in between. The order of AR and MA models is complementary. Like in AR approaches infinity, MA has the order one, as you saw. It's the sum of the orders essentially similar. Um, so it may be, okay? So what, what the sort of equivalence we talked about or uh, what I tried to mean last time was something like this. So an AR infinite, infinite series is similar to an MA1 series, okay? And with the, using the similar argument, you may also come up with something like this. An AR1 model is equivalent to an MA infinite series, okay? So it is possible that uh, you have, so, so if, for example, you have some sort of a data that uh, you don't see it can be well specified using an individual AR model or an individual MA model. So what you are look, saying is that if I try to fit an ARMA 3.1 model, okay, which basically says that AR order 3 MA model, MA order 1, this is the model I'm trying to fit over here. Is this going to be equivalent to an ARMA 2 2 series or ARMA 1 3 series or possibly 1 4 series or say 4, not 4 0, 4 1 series. Okay. Uh, if you are asking whether this is always going to be true, so what I am, the way I am going to answer is that you may play around these numbers a little bit. Okay. If you find that it does not in the, it's not a very, a very clear observation regarding the order of the model. It is not very clear from the data itself whether it should be an AR4 or an MA4 or an AR3 or MA3. Uh, and rather it is something like an ARMA model, ARMA PQ. Then you can play around with the parameters PQ to see which model fits best. What I mean by which model fits best? You remember the information criteria? This was a measure of our goodness of fit, right? So essential, so when you talk about goodness of fit, there are two things you need to understand, okay? So first thing is, what do I mean by goodness of fit? There is an essential criteria regarding goodness of fit. So when I say an ARMA PQ, okay, let, let me talk from the generic version itself. So an ARMA PQ fits the, data. This is what I'm trying to say. In that case, essential condition regarding this particular statement has to be that the residuals that I have, that's a white noise series. This is essential for me to say that this ARMAPQ model fits the data. This is absolutely essential criteria. Okay. Based on your level of significance, the residuals after fitting the ARMAPQ needs to be a white noise series. Now you may say that there are multiple values of P and Q which might satisfy this particular criteria. Then which is the one you should choose? If it is an individual AR or the individual MA models, so just AR, MA, ARP or an MAQ, then you go with the model of where P or Q is small. 
okay so in a basically i'm saying a smaller order model i should use to fit my data the question is if it is an arma pq where where we have both the values of p and q it is basically the combination that i'm looking for in that case what i can use is that i can use the akaik information criteria to have my interpretation how do i use it so let's say there are multiple values of multiple combinations of p and q which fit my data okay say a model 2 1 fits another model 2 2 fits another model 3 1 fits and another model 1 3 fits all of these uh, satisfy this particular criteria let's say this is this is just an example that i am trying to give okay i want to figure out which is the model which is then best for me all of these have orders which is not very high if you even combine the values of p and q it is less than equals to 4 so decent enough right there won't be too many parameters in this particular model the question is how do i go about uh, using it in practice then i look at the aic parameter what is aic does anyone remember what was the akai key information criteria who can tell me what was the aic forget about the formula i'm i'm not talking about the formula i don't expect you to remember the formula but just the intuition what was the aic intuition what was the intuition for aic come on guys you no, should be was, able to say this one it was like the r square in regression as in um, how much uh, of the dependent variable can the independent variables be responsible for yes ritu you want to say something um am i audible hello okay it fits the data and determines the minimum error uh, how do you see minimum error as in it's an issue from your side we can hear the audio is it oh sorry guys yeah uh, can can anyone speak again please hello sir are we audible hello okay uh just for testing purpose can any of you guys please speak up there was an issue with my audio i just yeah, tried to sir are you audible am i audible yes 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 thank you thank you yeah sorry yeah tell me yeah so uh, aic fits the data in the model and uh, determines the uh, minimum residuals uh minimum residuals as in what does aic measure can you tell me that so it uh, tells the order for which the re residuals are minimum no remember what what aic we used aic for determining the order right but aic does not give you the order what aic does is that it tells us something different about the uh, model itself it gives one specification for the model it estimates something of the model based on the aic value we determine which should be the best fit for the our data okay now what is that aic actually measures can anyone tell me i'm um, sir can you hear me yes yes i can Uh, so like i said earlier it was like the r square in um, regression so like how much is the uh, independent variable responsible for the changes in the dependent variable 
uh, or explains it okay it is slightly different it was basically some sort of an estimation about your uh, model fit model fit in terms of your sigma a square right after fitting the data what was the error and based similar to your adjusted r square we also penalized it based on the uh, order of the model itself right yes we are trying to minimize the residual error with also specifying the order of the model so what aic does is that if we can if we can now determine if we can figure out what is the aic for these different fitted values of p and q or the different orders of pq in that case i would choose the model which has the least aic is that clear if say is ar ma pq as i said let this there be let there be four models which fit all our data which all satisfy the condition that after fitting this arma 21223113 all of them after the fitting the the data with the specified model my residuals are a white noise series okay question is which one do i choose or use one for my data i would go with the one which has the least ais is that clear we try to do that today okay we'll try to do that with some of our existing data sets we'll try to figure out what is the specified order and what happens if we change the parameter slightly okay can we make any different interpretation out of it is that clear okay thank you so yeah let let's come back to our discussion on esea okay so what esea does is that it tries to fit different data sets uh, fit different models to our data set based on the values of p and q and it tells you what all orders of p and q are significant or not okay by default this esea function doesn't return the uh, aca for or the the corresponding aca for psea values but it just tells you which all are significant and which all are not so it would look something like this it would look like uh let's say 0 0 0 0 and then possibly if you process 0 then again see process process 0 sorry this is what this is so a combination of process and zeros okay so process are the one which are not significant and zeros are the one which are significant okay now how do i make interpretation out of it why haven't i shown it in your slide the result the, the primary reason being that this esea function okay this esea function currently is not available in uh, in r okay if you see if you are using the current version of r that is r version 4.0 or higher this esea function is not supported or the library which used to uh, support this esea is not working for uh, this current version it was working for the earlier version which is 3.6.3 i suppose but for the 4.0.2 or the more recent ones we are not able to use this esea function so we are not able to uh, use this one in practice or or currently but in case if we have a, it doesn't make sense for us at this point of time to go back uh, on the r version just to use this function because there is an alternative way to determine this okay or there is an alternative way to make this there is the same conjecture again so this esef plot will ideally or esef table would be uh, something again like this and I'm, i'm still telling you how to use it in, in practice in case r comes up with a modification whereby the esef is again available uh, and also if you are using some other alternative packages where it is available let me tell you how to make interpretation out of it okay so if in case uh, if in case your data is from an let's say one two process okay so one two process as in it would be over here right then you should find something like this uh 
I'll explain it to you what I mean by that. Don't worry. Ideally, this is what you should find. Okay. What do I mean by that? So you would have, if your data comes from an AR1 uh, or an ARMA12 process, then you should find a pattern of a triangle of significant values which has the center or the tip at these values okay is this clear how to use this esef table Okay, if you can use this ESCF table, if it is possible in your package to use the ESCF table function, I'll give you a document how to use this ESCF function. Currently, based on the version that I requested you to install, this is not available, but in case it becomes available, you should find something like this. So, if it is from an AR12 process, then you should find a series of significant values of these uh, parameters which should have the tip at one, two, okay? And all the followings, there should be a triangle following it, okay? If instead of one, two, this was at one, one, then you, these values should also be zero, okay? If instead of one, two, this was at one, one, this is the modification that should happen. So this one should also be zero, 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 okay? Instead of one, two, if this was say one, zero, okay, or an AR one process, additional to these, these values should also be zero. Okay. Question is, is this going to be uh, very defined in all cases? Actually not, okay. In your book, there is an example given uh, in your say book you would find that it's possible that you may not find all these continuous zero values next to each other. There may be some one or two aberrations per se. Okay. So in between there can be some uh, non-significant values as well, but still we can use this to a good extent. Okay. You don't have to be worried about it too much. Okay. So uh, determining the order of uh, ARMAPQ. This is not possible through ACF alone. This is not possible through PACF alone. This is possible through ESCF, but here we have uh, hit a problem because this is right now is not supported in our package. Okay. So what I will do is that I'll tell you some sort of a shortcut per se. Okay. Now let me come back to it a little later. So this is just uh, simulation examples using the uh, what happens when I change the values of this. Uh, these are is an ARMA11 process. Okay. So AR value at point eight, MA value at point one. This is just to show you how it looks like. Okay. I think this one we showed last class also, right? If I'm not wrong, we showed this ACF and PACF plot in our last class, did I? Okay, but anyways, won't take too much of time. So this is here I'm simulating an ARMA11 series with AR value 0.8, that is 51.8 and theta 1.4. I'm creating 500 observations. I'm scaling all the values up to the value of 10. And I want to see what is the ACF. So here you can see that though I have plotted it to 10 uh, orders, even till order 10, all of the ACFs are significant. What happens with PACF? Even PACF is significant till almost 4 lakhs. Okay. So it would seem that there, there are uh, at least there are multiple values. So uh, should I go ahead fitting an AR? four model for this data, you can do so, but uh, you need to figure out how good that data is, okay, or, or how good that fit is, 
an alternative to this would be uh, let me show you a, a data which which essentially comes from an uh, ARMA process. Okay, so here I'm trying to read the uh, returns for 3M. Okay, so 3M is the company. All of you have heard about it. We are using uh, the 3M monthly return data starting from 1946 to 2008. Okay. By now you understand how I am doing this. I'm converting into a time series. I'm plotting that time series, and I'm looking at the ACF PSM plots. Okay, so here I am not plotting the order zero. I've started after that. So ACF you can see is significant at order three and order six, also at order ten. So no no clear pattern per se. Uh, if I if I want to look at the PSCF, uh, let me just open up my R model and, and try to do that. So what I did is it essentially was, uh, let me write a new script. So I am trying to read the, so now I have moved to R, right? So what I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to work with the 3M data. So this is M, PM four six zero eight. Okay, and I am running this particular data. If I do that, you would find that. Okay, so something that I forgot. So I need to specify data equals to T. Okay, and run this data again. So here I can observe that I have my dates and I have my returns. I'm assuming that all of these are logarithmic returns based on the information. So we have monthly returns from 1946 February till uh, I have till 2008 if I'm not wrong. Okay. So 2008 December, correct? Uh, if I want to run a plot of this particular data, how do I do that? I If I just specify plot, uh, I need to also specify, okay, so data 3M is basically the second column of this data, okay. Now I want to plot this data, data. If I just by default plot it, it should be a point plot like this. I hope you can see these things, right? Okay, but it doesn't make too much of a sense at this point of time. If I write mention as type equals to L, then it will draw it as a line plot, which is far, far better. So this is how it looks like the data. If I want to now bring in the uh, the time series component of it, so I am going with data 3M TS. All I need to specify is Yes, I need to specify the data. So data is data 3M. This is monthly data. So frequency would be 12. And start value would be combination of 1946. I suppose February was the first observation. Okay. If I do so, I'm converted it to a time series. Now, if I want to see the plot, uh, data PM yes okay so now I have the proper x axis right so if I now want to see the ACF PSCF plots of the data ACF of data underscore 3m okay b 
because of the first one, I am not very clear about how many of these are significant because the first value is very high at one. So I would rather, um, as I said, this was the modification we did. Um, but we said plot equals to false. And then we said now plot this one, but only one to 10. This is how it looks like, right? Something that you had for your given data. What happens if I want to see the PACF plot? So, this is the PACF plot. Again, for the PACF also, you observe that there is no fixed pattern. Okay, so both ACF and PACF observe that this is what you're seeing, right? For both the ACF data and the PACF, so let me just, it's not very clear, let me just put in some uh, main equals to ACF PM monthly returns so acf value you can see very clearly there is no clear pattern you have it significant at lag 3 lag 6 and lag 10 okay and same for your PACF, you can see these are significant also at similar lags, three, six, and 10. So you are not able to make any interpretation of individually the AR and MA models, right? The question is that, how do you do that? So this is sort of a trick. For that, I need the library forecast, okay? So it's already installed in my package, I hope, but still, let me just check. I need the forecast package. Okay, in R. Okay, let me first check if the line I have the forecast package available with me. Yeah, I, I already have it installed, right? So then I do this auto dot arima. And I just specify the data set, which is data 3M. Can you see guys what I'm, the result of this particular plot or the result of this particular command? Can you see the, the output? It gives Arima 313, okay, as the best model. And uh, what else can you say? So what auto, auto Arima does is that it tells you that based on, on the specifications provided, it seems as though uh, 313 is the best right, best fitted model, okay? Now, what is this 313? As of now, we didn't talk about any of this, right? We didn't talk about why. So it says that Arima, Three one three. This is the best fitted model. Okay. As in the AR order is three. So this is your three. 
this is called your D and this is called Q. Okay. Question is, we still now understand what is P, what is Q, what is this D? Okay. Let us first understand what is this D and we'll come back to this example again. Okay. Is that clear? We'll come back to this and why didn't I introduce this function in the first time? Okay. Why am I doing this now? Okay. Because this possibly uh, solves most of your problem. You didn't have to do anything. It just tells you what is the best written model. Why I didn't introduce in the first place is that just this model itself, just by looking at the output, you cannot make any conjecture. Okay. You need the prerequisites per se to have an understanding based on this particular result. Okay. To interpret the result, you needed the earlier theories. Okay. So let's now try to have an understanding of what this D is. How is this useful and how does it fit into our scheme of things as of this point? Okay. So let's take you back to our slides where we now talk about stationary. Any questions till this point? Before we start discussing about stationarity, do you guys have any questions? So what is this concept of stationary? As of now, you have observed that we have talked about certain data based on the plot itself. We said that if the data is such that the distribution, the, the, the mean and the variance are, are finite, Okay, mean is constant, variation is finite, and, and the covariance between uh, the, the series and its lag series is not a function of time, but it is just a function of how many, uh, what is the difference between these two lags? Uh, that, that should be a considered a weekly stationary series. Okay, we also talked about in financial applications, uh, we ideally expect the price series to be non-stationary okay at the same time we expect the return series to be stationary and stationarity is an essential concept or the essential assumption for all of our time series modeling uh, for stationarity we have strong stationarity and weak stationarity okay so what strong stationarity requires that the joint distribution of all your observations from the data set at any given point in time for a specified period is constant no matter how you shift your observations okay we also talked about in, in practice count stationarity is not this is more of an european concept we don't find it in practice but we find the weak stationarity for weak stationarity we had those three conditions that we just mentioned okay mean constant uh, constant mean the variance is finite and you have the covariance which is just a function of uh, covariance is a function of l which is just the displacement between or the lags between these two observations right so now that we have these things uh, what do i mean by stationarity and what is what are non stationarity okay so non stationarity in a data is is very common okay in many cases we have uh, non stationary series Say for example, interest rates, right? Interest rates in itself are a, not a return uh, series, right? And it doesn't make it doesn't make sense for you to have a uh, take take you know convert interest rates into such a way that it becomes a stationary series. In itself, station interest rates may not be a stationary series in the first place. For an exchange rate, asset prices, all of these may be non-stationary. So the first, there are very various versions of non-stationarity or non-stationarity in a data can rise due to multiple reasons. Okay. First thing that we check is called unit rule. Okay. 
So what do I mean by a unit root? So a unit root in data, or we say when our data suffers from the unit root problem, or our data seems to have a unit root, okay? When we have something like this, pt equals to pt minus one plus at, okay? So at any point of time, I intentionally didn't write it as RT, so it's not a return series, let's say it's just a price series, okay? So price today is equal to price yesterday plus an error. Or this error can be also interpreted as new information, okay, or impact of new information. So in without this new information, price today should be same as price yesterday. So this is very much possible for our financial data, right? So it can be that it is just a PT equals to PT minus one plus eighty. What is the problem with this data is this would give rise to non-stationarity in the data. Remember an AR1 series. If we try to fit an AR series, what is that you can say about it? If we try to fit an AR model to this data, what is the specification of that AR model? If we try to fit an AR model to this data, what should we observe? The coefficient would be one. So as in you want to say, it is basically like phi zero equals to zero in this case, phi one equals to one, okay? And as you have very clearly suggested, that it's very much possible that the series would become a divergent series, okay? Depending on if the, if the error terms you are seeing are positive or negative errors, this can be a boundless value at any point of time. Okay, this can become a very divergent series. Will it al always be a divergent series? May not be. Okay. Is, is there any other name that you have seen for such a data? Does this data follow a Brownian motion? You have heard about Brownian motion, right? physics does this data follow brownian motion a random motion brownian motion yes so this is a random walk right okay so we'll see we'll try to specify what is random walk random motion of particles so you can figure out that this is one sort of problem that can arise in our data, okay? So if we want to figure out if our data suffers from the unit root problem, we want to check accordingly. Is this the only type of problem that may arise in our data? May not be so. So say for example, if we want to say what is the, you what is, this is called, this is one type of non-stationarity, it arises due to the unit root problem. It is called unit root non-stationary time series, and this is, as you correctly mentioned, this is a random walk model, right? Okay, so what happens is that, say for example, P0 is the initial value, okay? A starting value of the process, and based on the error, you have a white noise series, based on the sequence of this white noise series, this can go up or down, okay? So what happens when you try to fit such a model? Will all of these be divergent? It may not be divergent. Why not? Because error term in itself, uh, this is, yeah. So Shubham, as you, as you mentioned that the series will be divergent, will it always be divergent? What I will say is that it may be divergent. Why? It may not be divergent also. And over long period of time, it is it will definitely be not divergent. Why? Because this AT in itself is going to be a zero mean error, right? So it will it will keep on moving, but yes, based on the error term itself, it will not be a uh, it will not be always growing, right? Maybe growing in some period, reducing because otherwise the expectation of the error will not be zero. Okay. Problem happens when you try to forecast with this. Forecasting is something that we haven't done so far. We will we'll do that in today's class. What do I mean by forecasting? So, what happens in, in our time series analysis is that once you have identified the best fitted model for our data, 
we use that data and try to forecast the for future values okay so say for example if you this is again will be part of your assignment you would be required to do this so uh, based on say monthly okay so monthly series you try to fit in you till use data from 2005 till 2000 uh, say 18 or, or to 2019 december okay this is uh, pay, pay close attention to this this, this is going to be the same instruction that i'll be providing for your assignment as well this is going to be the group assignment okay not individual assignment so you need to pick a stock okay if there are any conditions based on the choice of that stock i'll specify them once you have identified the stock take data from 2015 till end of 2019 so five full years of data okay try to and identify the best fitted data or best fitted model or an arma process which explains the return series okay once you have done that use that model and using that model try to predict this i'm talking about monthly returns not daily returns so monthly returns five years so based on 60 observations that you have uh, we'll see if we want to expand the number of observations uh, thereafter but let's consider at least 60 observations based on 60 observations you figure out an arma model that best describes your data you fit the data and try to estimate the expected returns for the first four months in 2020 why first four months because after that there has been lot in the market which would affect the prices accordingly but let's talk about the first three four months okay three to four period of prediction you should be able to do from your data okay i'm going to teach you how to do that uh, this is going to be an application so more of just use of ar uh, or or r functions to do that okay so once you have done this uh, the problem is when i'm talking about forecasting and my fitted model is a is a unit root random walk model what is going to be the estimate values okay estimate values so estimated future values if i'm talking about l age period ahead forecast okay so standing on 2012 or uh, sorry on standing on december 31st 2019 if i were to predict the return values monthly return values for a particular stock for the next 4 months if it is one period ahead i say my forecasting horizon is one if it is two periods ahead i say my forecasting horizon is two so h that you see in this uh, in this notation that's called the forecasting horizon okay so how many period ahead value i am trying to predict what you will observe is that that prediction is always going to be same as your value there sorry uh, you need to be careful h is based on where you are standing and l is the the value of how many periods ahead you are predicting so you are using data so so let me just illustrate this so that you are not confused let's say you have data from uh january 2015 till march 2020 okay i am saying subset this data okay so subset 1 is january 15 to december 19 this is going to be your sample data that you are going to use to model or develop the model okay and you will also have this january 20 to march 20 so 3 months of data that is going to be your hold out sample right we are not using this data for modeling but this is the data we are going to use for prediction okay so this is my uh, observed values so you have here 60 observations right from january 15 to december 19 and observation 61 62 and 63 these are my hold out sample so if i am standing in period 60 okay so r 60 and i am trying to forecast one period ahead 
that means i am basically trying to predict the january 20 returns okay if standing in december 20 i am trying to forecast three period ahead i am basically trying to forecast the march 20 figures okay what will happen with this forecasting when you have a process like this okay it is always going to be same right if it follows a random walk model no matter how many period ahead you are trying to predict the predicted value is going to be the december 19 value okay so this process it, it, it always is at the same level okay so it is always the forecast is going to be the value of the series at the forecast horizon what again is going to happen is that the variance of this forecast okay so you are trying to forecast three period ahead this is going to be a parameter of l sigma a square okay so what does it mean so sigma a square is going to be finite if it is based on our assumption regarding the error model itself right but what happens to l the more period ahead you are trying to forecast the more the error is going to be okay the variance of this error is going to grow with the the period ahead you are predicting okay so it does not make sense to make prediction when your model itself follows a random one, okay so this is one type of non stationarity in it in your data the second sort of non stationarity in your data is going to be random walk with drift okay so what happens when when it is random walk with drift when you have a series which is essentially random walk with drift there is also a coefficient okay so pt equals to mu plus pt minus 1 plus at okay when mu is a constant now what you have is basically what shubham mentioned earlier now you would end up having a divergent series okay this may be the mean returns mean monthly returns if your series in itself is is a random walk okay any time it is going to be equal to last period and some fundamental uh, you know returns based on the based on the fundamental section okay so pt equals to mu plus pt minus 1 plus at this also gives rise to non stationarity in your data based on no matter how small the value of mu is if you are if your data is uh, having such a thing okay then this is this it is not possible okay uh, this 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 data cannot be ideally modeled why because if you if you look at just repeated substitution what do you mean by repeated substitution so pt i say is So for your, this is what we have, pt equals to pt minus 1 plus kd, okay. So in that case, pt minus 1 by same logic is going to be pt minus 2 plus kd minus 1. And pt minus 2 is going to be pt minus 3 plus kd minus 2. Now, this is just random walk. Now, if you have a random walk, with drift what happens now this becomes mu plus this pt plus 2 or or this value we substitute here right so here we can write this as mu plus mu plus pt minus 2 plus at minus 2 plus at sorry this is at minus 1 so essentially you have 2 mu plus pt minus 2 plus at plus at minus 1 if i keep on doing that it becomes pt equals to the this becomes t times mu plus p0 the initial value from where it all started plus a summation of this error terms right so what happens now this at any point of time is going to be a divergent series no matter what the initial value of p0 was okay so this is again a non stationary series can anyone suggest me how can i make changes to this series so that it becomes stationary can anyone suggest what is the possible changes that i can make this model so that it becomes 
it, it is free from this problem. Let me just clear up the what you're seeing is that. Plus yes, Prajit. Good solution. That may be one of the ways whereby I can make uh, this particular problem to go away. So for those, okay. Now let's see what happens. So P T minus P T minus one equals to I'm saying pt minus 1 plus pt minus 2 plus at minus at minus 1. Okay. Now, if I can explain this as rt equals to rt minus 1 plus at minus at minus 1. So, if this is a price series, then the difference of the price series, if these are log price series, the difference of log price is returns, right? So this data doesn't have that problem anymore, okay? Uh, so provided your return series is not a random walk, okay? Provided your return series is not a random walk, it may be possible for you to get rid of the random, the problem with the random walk with drift in your data by taking first difference, okay? Is that clear to all of you? How first differencing may help. I'm not saying first differencing will always help. It will depend on if the return series in itself is random walk or not. If it is random walk, there is nothing we can do at this point of time. But if the return series in itself is not a random walk, then may, we may get rid of the problem itself by, yeah, sorry, let me repeat that. So essentially we are saying that our price series is suffering from the problem of it has random walk with drift. If that happens, then this is what you see, right? Based on this argument, I can write PT minus one in this way. And subsequently, this is the modified form of our equation, okay? Good thing about this data is that this return series in itself, this is not necessarily, this is not non-stationary. Okay. By definition, this is stationary. Sorry, sorry, sorry. By definition, this is, this is not, this is non-stationary. This may not be non-stationary. This may be stationary as well. It depends on the process of RT, okay? That we can test in our data. If RT is stationary or non-stationary, but by the modeling itself, it is not going to be non-stationary, okay? Is that clear, Saurabh? Okay. So this was our second source of non-stationary, I think. This is, oh, okay. we are done with one hour. So let, let's take a break now, okay? We'll come back and then we'll resume our discussion, okay? I hope till this point, this was okay, right? If you have any further doubts, please feel free to put it in the chat box, okay?
Returns are quite good.
okay so uh, some of the queries that i got first was uh, regarding uh, non stationarity of a random walk series right so this is random walk without drift right so yes random walk without drift is going to be don't be bothered where yes let me try to clarify so let's start with something so you have your data it can be stationary it can also be non stationary first of type of non stationary data that you can c is due to a random walk data okay what is random walk in case of a random walk this is p t minus 1 plus a t okay this is the sort of first model that we saw the first process or first first reason why your data is non stationary can be that the data is simply a random walk data okay in case of a random walk data it is not possible to model this data okay why because uh, it doesn't solve it doesn't work with forecasting of it it is going to be incredibly difficult random walk is not a particularly time series data it's just saying that at any point of time your observation is as good as use your past observation okay so it doesn't make sense second type of non stationarity you have in your data can arise due to random walk with drift okay if that happens then you observe something like this pt equals to mu plus pt minus 1 plus at okay there is possibility you can get Rid of this through differencing. Okay, in that case, there is a condition whereby it will be possible if R T in itself is stationary. Okay, then you may get rid of this problem of non-stationarity by transforming your data by taking the first difference itself. Okay. now you let's move to the third type of non stationarity which is where the stationary non stationarity comes in a multiplicative form as in it is called trend stationary what do i mean by trend stationary in the earlier model you saw that there was there was one series okay which was there was a trend component to it there's a mu but the mu in itself didn't have any t parameter okay it was constant so every period there was a finite return which was getting accumulated okay so the price at any point of time was increasing by a finite predetermined amount and the, there was some sort of a shock which was coming in every period which is basically the white noise eating thing okay here you have something which is called as a trend stationary okay so what happens with trend stationary data trend stationary is look something like this which is pt equals to beta 0 plus beta 1 times t plus rt where rt in itself is a stationary series okay so this is stationary but you have a multiplicative form and you have a constant what happens if i take differencing of this one what will happen for a trend stationary data what will happen if i have if i take take this one what will happen what happen if i take first different of my trend stationary data
it will be stationary it may become a stationary okay what will happen is that in that case if you take first difference okay then pt minus pt minus 1 i haven't defined rt as first difference of pt over here i'm just saying rt is a stationary series okay so this will become pt minus pt minus 1 or the first difference of pt b0 beta not will vanish due to differencing right beta 1 times t that will become a constant term now okay beta 1 times t that will become a constant term term and then you will have rt minus rt minus 1 those are two stationary series so it's possible that their difference will also be a stationary series okay so even if your data has trend stationary that can also be managed through taking first difference okay so you had three issues you had non stationarity due to random walk then you had uh random walk with drift and trend stationarity now random walk with drift and trend stationarity can be managed by taking first difference okay but just random walk that cannot be managed okay that cannot be we cannot transform it to make it uh, in any sort of stationary okay so our our so what will happen this is what's what is said right so the conventional approach to making or handling unit root non stationarity why is a unit root because it has only one root as of now so first so if it is unit root it should be managed by taking first difference only so let's say that the data is such a, in such a way that it follows an ar arima p1q what does it mean it essentially means in itself this process yt is non stationary okay but if you take first difference of the series so if you take yt minus yt minus 1 that should give rise to a stationary time series okay so that difference you are defining as ct over here okay so if i take yt minus yt minus 1 that should become a, that may become a stationary series which is ct it follows a stationary and an invertible arima pq model okay so arima p1q suggest if you take first difference of this series you can get arima pq model okay so as i mentioned earlier this price series by definition we assume it to be non stationary log return series is assumed to be stationary okay for because of this assumption we we uh, tested we we uh, in all of our previous uh, examples we did not explicitly test for stationarity of our data but now that you know but question is how do you test it now okay so how do you test if your data suffers from this problem okay so now that you you see the, once you plot this data okay once you plot this data you by just visual inspection you should have some sort of an idea in case of trend stationarity or in case of uh, random walk with drift okay problem is just by visual inspection it may not be very evident whether it is random walk with drift or if it is trend stationarity okay but just by visual inspection you may see a increasing or a decreasing trend lasting for several periods for both these data okay so just by visual inspection a trend stationary data may look very similar to a to your random walk with drift okay so uh, what happens in that case is that if you want to test whether this asset follows a random walk or a random walk with drift okay this is what we want to test so this this is what you see we test the null hypothesis whereby phi1 equals to 1 versus the alternate hypothesis where phi1 is less than 1 okay we basically we want to check if phi1 is 1 if phi1 equals to 1 the first series basically reduces to your uh, 
random walk and the second series basically reduces to your random walk with drift okay so we want to test for that okay this is known as the dicky fuller test so when i said that we want to test for uh, if if the, your data finally suffers from a unit root problem that can be tested through the dicky fuller or there is a version of it which is known as augmented dicky fuller test df or adf typically we go for adf test only okay so if this is a model what how do you estimate if this is one or not apply your intuition what sort of test should this be if in a model we want to estimate if one of our parameters is equal to one or not what sort of test are we looking for uh first saurabh's answer that it's a two sided test what two sided test there can be several two sided tests okay ravish hypothesis you need to get it clarified now what we just defined right now h not is phi 1 equals to 1 and h alternate is phi 1 less than 1 that is basically the our hypothesis that's our stated hypothesis stated hypothesis may be tested through different form of test statistics what is the appropriate test over here that should be a t test okay so we need to run a t test whereby we judge whether this phi 1 or if you think talk in terms of beta 1 so whether that phi 1 or beta 1 is uh, equal to 1 or not okay so i am not going into the the technicalities of it but you can very well guess it is going to be beta 1 minus 1 divided by some sort of a standard error okay so in case of dicky fuller test it's a standard error which is in the denominator in case of augmented dicky fuller if i am not wrong that is the standard deviation that you have in the denominator okay so essentially you are running a t test to determine whether this phi 1 equals to 1 or not okay so let's see some examples okay uh, let's first go back to our uh, examples that we had over here okay so all of you can see this r r screen that i have opened in front of me right you remember in our for that 3m data our this arima auto arima suggested that it's a 313 right what does it mean 313 so if you see this that was our 3m data okay now just by visual inspection it doesn't seem that it's a very clear non stationary okay but actually we should test for it okay how do i test for it it is typically tested by the adf function okay uh let me just check if i need to load any libraries for that uh yeah i need the f unit roots library okay so i need to get this library for uh, reading this thing okay now if i want to test whether this is uh, i write adf test okay and the data i have is data 3m okay how many lakhs do i test let's say i test for 10 lakhs okay and type i don't specify anything uh, sorry i needed to load that library just library and if you need oops okay now if i run this so what you have here is that this p value okay 
this p value is extremely small okay what does that mean if p value is very small then this is a uh, then this particular data is the hypothesis that uh, this data has unit root that can be rejected okay so this particular model suggested arima 313 right so here you see the fallacy of using directly a formula so what you see here is that your adf test clearly say states that so adf test is testing for unit root present that's your h not and h a is unit to not present okay so here i am rejecting my null and accepting the alternate okay that means i should ideally not require to put in this new parameter it doesn't make sense okay but still it found out that this particular 313 fits better okay now let me try to forcefully fit an arima 33 model and see what happens to my aic okay uh, this data i have is data 3m or the equals to 303 sorry so we can use Uh, trace equals to three instead of three. Remember, it will show all the models being considered. Yes, it can be, but but let me just uh, do it just individually also. Okay. So here, what we have is that the value of AIC is minus two thousand over here, and this is nineteen eighty five point seven nine. Okay. so i would rather say that if you are have a choice between 313 and 303 over here this model seems to fit better and it doesn't uh, violate it because the adf test what was not rejected okay so if what did this for this particular data is that it for fitted this particular data okay so i there is not too much of a difference if i fit if i try to fit in something else this is just for illustration purpose how do you make significance okay uh yeah okay as you can see i what i have done is that i have i'm trying to fit all all different sorts of models over here okay and seeing what all are the aic values okay and uh, based on this the default chosen was this one by the auto arima but based on the aic criteria only i can see that this one also is a, is a decent enough fit 303 okay so i would rather go with the one with lesser aic so if you see how aic is defined it is the uh 
you let's go back to your initial slides how we defined aic just give me a second just this is just for your recap okay so why are you getting uh, so small values for the aic because this is log of sigma l square right so log of sigma l square if sigma l in itself is very small log of sigma l square can be a negative quantity so even after putting in 2l by t so square by 2l is the number of parameters okay so 2l is small if t is large enough this 2l by t is going to be small enough right so if your sigma l square which is basically the error uh, squared right if that's small enough your aic can be a negative quantity also okay so so no issues with it don't get confused just by seeing uh, negative quantities in your in your aic model or your aic results this is very much acceptable okay so i would rather argue that uh, this arima 303 is the best fitted model among the ones that we see over here any doubts so if you are using if you are using auto arima be very careful about using auto arima okay so uh, i haven't used the tres but as devan suggested let me try using the if i put in trace equals to true then what happens okay so let's see it it start try testing with uh, 212 with drift it was 1955 101 with drift is minus 1421 1640 so among the ones yeah so what has happened is that throughout it has put in uh, the all of these things with the d parameter of 1 that's why you are seeing in, in they didn't even test with 303 but even with 303 it does seems to fit okay so uh, yes sir so sir the the my question was this only so like how does auto radima decide uh, which all models to test like which all to compare frankly, so like so frankly speaking i didn't look into that documentation okay what i what i read into this uh, this auto arima is that it will test several models okay uh, so what i would rather argue is go with your first principles okay so first principles means i am not advocating using auto arima directly without putting in any further thought okay so what am i what am i asking you to do you can first have a look at the plot okay so this is the plot that you saw right uh, based on the data itself have a look at the plot uh, based on the plot itself can you make some sort of a conjecture so this is the time series plot of the 3m data okay to me visually it doesn't seem i don't seem to have any conclusive idea whether it is it has drift or not okay there is it's not very evident so if it is not evident i would rather go and test with the augmented dicky fuller test okay to see if there is any unit root uh, stationarity or non stationarity i would look at the acf psf plots is there any conjecture i can make out of it directly from the acf psf plots i was not able to do that from the acf psf data this was my acf which had significant acfs at 3 6 and 10 same for the psf whereby i had at 3 6 and 10 okay as a reference starting point as a reference starting point i i insist that you use the auto arima okay to determine a good starting point once you do that once you determine a good starting point then tweak around with the parameters okay play around with the p q parameters d parameter that should be clear enough from whether it whether after differencing uh, so right now augmented dicky fuller didn't even prop, you know have we didn't even see any problem with it okay so it suggested that there is no unit rule let's say that that particular result had thrown out that the data had non stationarity in it okay if that was the case i would take the first difference and then check for adf again 
okay if i am convinced that the data doesn't have any any non stationarity then i would rather put in the d parameter as zero and then play around with the p and q parameters look at the one which gives me the least value for aic that would be my recommendation uh, sir so a follow up question so yes. uh, if d is equal to zero if you are going with that so yeah. like uh, does it make sense to like um, uh, make a nested for loop with pdq and then find out the rma values for each and then use the aic to compare amongst all of them yes you can do so so in that case you are basically saying some sort of a two stage process okay yeah. whereby you determine the the d order first and then thereafter look at uh, the the values of the aic with different weighted values of p and q right yes that you can do i i don't have a problem with it okay okay sir. i don't have a problem with it you you can try it out okay but i'm saying i i suggest this auto arima should also have some sort of a logic but at this point of time i am not aware of how it, it determines at its starting point at least from the differencing point of view okay okay so let's see few more examples then we talk about forecasting okay so here we have uh, let's talk about gdp data okay let's see what sort of interpretations we get here so this is your gdp us gdp data so quarterly data we have right starting from 1947 till 2008 this data you can very well it's a very clean data right so so trend pretty much visible so what you observe from it is that this data definitely is not stationary okay from the plot it is evident okay so what do i do uh, let's take for acf of that data okay so the raw data we had we have taken a log transformation of the gdp data okay so this is transformed so log transformation of gdp if i take acf of that data okay if i take acf you can see all the acf values seem to be close to 1 okay so no no interpretation i can make out of it if you even if you had tested for psef of this particular data i would see i would think that there would be similar observations also okay so this data definitely is not stationary so without further i would take first difference and test for it okay so i am taking first so so rather let me test for it we using the data itself okay so let me read this data over here uh, i think it's it's better visible for you if i write it as a script right this file is named as qgdp 4708.txt let me run this one first okay and if i read this uh, yeah the first line had hit us so let me just modify by inserting header equals to true and run this line again okay now i have read this particular data year month day gdp so what you can also observe is that the first observation is 1947 january next is of april then is of july then october then this is quarterly data right so what i am doing here is now i am reading the gdp as log of uh the da table but what was the value it was in the fourth column right so i'm reading the fourth column value so for that i'm putting in comma 4 and i'm taking just log transformation of it okay now this will get converted into a gdp series home um, so yes yes so the pdf is visible we can't see the r screen oh oh sorry sorry just a second just a second thank you thank you for pointing it out so this is what i did so i'm trying to uh, so i suppose if i'm writing in the console it is both going too low so you may not be able to see it but uh, if i'm writing in the script you can see it right 
it's better visible for you is it yes sir yes sir okay so what i all i did is that i read that file into a da data frame uh, if i open the data frame i can see that it has four columns year month day and gdp so month 1417 1417 so this is quarterly data all of it is on first of every month and these are the gdp values so what i'm all i'm doing is that i i read that into da and gdp value i'm storing and it is an array okay so all our operations we would typically tend to work on an array rather than on a data frame okay so i stored i imported the data into a data frame but my specific i am working on a single time series that's a gdp data so i'm storing it in an array okay now if i plot this data okay uh by now you also know that i prefer working with the time series so gdp ts so this is going to be the gdp data uh frequency is going to be 12 uh, sorry 4 because it is quarterly data and i need to also see what is the starting this is 1947 1 okay so start equals to c 1947 even the frequency should be 3 no no why not 3 so look at this so for 1947 okay how what what does r enter what does r understand it understands for every value of 1947 what all how many values of the second parameter should there be okay okay So for 1947, there should be four values. So one, two, three, four. If I had specified 1947 comma three, it would understand still that every value of 194 or every value of the first one should uh, have four values for the next one. So if I'm starting in 1947 three, that would mean first value 1947 three, next one 1947 four, then again 1948 one, 1948 two. Okay. If you are putting in as three, then every value of year should correspond to three values of your observation, which is not true, right? Okay, sir, got it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, okay. So when you are running running it from script, if you if you just want to run this particular line, you can just click on run. It just executes this line. If you want all of this together, you can select and then hit run. So now I want to plot this data. So plot GDP TS. Okay. Yeah, very clearly visible that uh, this even after log transformation, this data is definitely not stationary. Okay. So what happens if I go with ADF test? ADF test of this uh, GDP data. Let me put in lags equal to second. Okay, I'm testing till ten lakhs. You can see the p-value is very high, right? That means the null hypothesis cannot be rejected. So null hypothesis was presence of unit two. Okay, so the null hypothesis was not rejected. Okay, so let me define a new series which is GDP underscore difference. Okay, GDP underscore difference, and I say this as difference of GDP series. If I don't specify anything else, this would become a difference of one. Okay, so first difference. So let me run this one and see what happens. So this is the first difference of the GDP series. Let me now plot it. Plot GDP difference. Mind it, I'm not doing it as a uh, time series. Okay, so GDP diff uh, type. Equals to L, so that it doesn't give me just like dots. So yeah, now you see if I take the first difference of it, at least visually it seems that uh, it may be stationary enough. At least clearly non-stationary, it is definitely not, right? So now let me run the ADF test again on this difference series and see how what sort of if I am seeing any changes. Okay. Now you see the change in output, uh, but even now you can see that it's still point three two eight six. Okay, so even after first differencing, there is some sort of a presence of uh, 
it is still not free of that problem. So you might need to take further differences also. Okay, so let's see what I did over here. So this is my uh, GDP. Okay, so yeah, same, right? 1947-1. This is log of GDP. This is the plot I saw. Okay, so this is the uh, ACF plot for the GDP data, right? So now you see there is still some further problems in this data, as in uh, the lag, lag one autocorrelation ACF is significant, two is significant, then five is significant, also nine, ten is significant. Okay, even for PSCF, one is significant, two is significant, nine is significant, uh, three is also significant, right? So I. We couldn't, uh, the series itself is still not stationary. Okay, so what I do is that uh, we try to fit the first difference series with an AR model. Okay, I'm not saying this is the best fitted model. So this is what we have. Okay, so there is one more thing that you need to be uh, careful. So your augmented Dickey Fuller, remember that there were two, two different things possible. It was either a random walk with drift, it could check for that. It could also check if it was a random walk with train stationary. Okay, so for the first difference, uh, yeah, this is what I did. Okay, just go through it later. So, this is through the base series, this is after taking the different series. Okay, ADF test. Now I see uh, when I type, specify the type is C, okay, which is just random walk with drift. This particular series shows that it is now stationary. So I can use the first difference GDP series, okay, uh, for my further processing. I'm not showing the model for which I tried to fit, I'm just showing you how I made this work series stationary, okay. Um, now what happens with an index data? Okay, that was GDP data. With index data, again you can see this was, this data is clearly non-stationary. This is a uh, daily level data. So I had to take 365.25, but technically it is not, not accurate because this will be having observations only for uh, the trading days. Okay, so 365.25 is not exactly accurate it will be having uh, ideally around 250 observations per year. Okay, but still S&P 500, you can see that uh, the difference, this, this base series was, was definitely not stationary. So what I did is that we try to see the different series. This is how the different series look like. And uh, because we know index data is known to have random walk with drift. Okay, because of that, we are using the CT option rather than C option in an augmented DP fuller, okay? So this is just not, we are not just taking for random work, we are taking for random work with drift. That's why we are putting the CT parameter, okay? So now we see that uh, the base series had a random work with drift, but the differenced series did not have the problem, okay? So this is how you get rid of the stationarity problem, okay? Is it clear till this point? Whatever we did, is this clear till this point? Okay. Um, so, yeah. Saurav is asking, why are we taking log of the data? So we typically take into take log of the data. This is something that you may have seen for other, other financial applications also. So if you think that uh, the size is large enough, okay. Uh, yeah. So if you think that the size is large enough, then it makes sense for not using the log transformation and use just the raw one. But if you, if in, in such cases, the scale will always be a problem. Okay, so if you take the log of the data, uh, then you get rid of the scale problem. But problem is that 
the data you are finally modeling is not the raw data it is a log transform data so so this is what uh, the problem you may have out of transformation so this is something like this so your yt okay the scale of this data let's say is is huge okay so first it is 100 then it is 1000 in the next observations it is 10000 if you just put it try to put it in a linear scale it looks boundless okay rather than using this one if you take log of this data it would be 2 3 4 if you, if i am taking say log 10 if you are taking log base e the values won't be same but at least these would be linear in nature okay so something which looks exponential in the raw form would look linear in the log transform linear as in something like this okay so that's why we often take log transform of the data which we know has a scale problem okay it's not necessary that you need to take log transformation of everything but we, you may want to do that this is just for your uh, easier understanding but remember if you are taking this transformation you need to transform it back at the end of it what do i mean so you say you start with yt and you take log of yt okay and this you specify as xt and go about modeling this xt in your data okay if if this be your data if, if this is your your raw data then you are finally modeling this xt if that is true then what you need to do is that you say xt follows say an arma uh, one two okay so p equals to one q equals to two and you try to fit in this and then can compute the following values what you need to be careful with it is after you are done with it the value you are getting is still log of yt okay so you estimate that uh, say y uh, sorry x 101 is 2.05 if you are interested in yt you need to take e to the power 2.05 to figure out this okay so you need to back transform your data okay, okay now uh, couple of more things what happens with forecasting okay uh, this is okay let me now okay let me just show you one more thing and we'll, we'll come to forecasting. So this is uh, quarterly earnings data of Johnson & Johnson. Again, this is definitely not stationary. This is not a definitely a stationary series. Do you observe anything else in this data? Click, please pay close attention to the values towards the end. What do you observe? I suppose all of you are seeing this Johnson & Johnson earnings data, okay? What is that you observe in this data? Cycle becomes more pronounced later on. So, uh, I would rather say that there was something else to it. Okay, it is not just it is not stationary. There is seasonality in the data. Okay, so that seasonality is what causes this cyclicity. Okay, so there may be this. This is another layer of complication into your data. Okay, whereby it is the problem is not just with differencing. Okay, it is not just talking about price series. But it is also saying that there is something more to it, which is uh, this is just not a scale uh, problem or just the value is increasing. In addition to all of this, there is some sort of a cyclicality in your data. If these data are in quarterly frequency, as you can see over here, this is very clearly 
observable that see one, two, three, four. So in one of the quarters, there is a slump happening every year. Okay, there's a slump followed by a spike, then it decreases, decreases slowly, and there is again a slump. Okay. So this data we say suffers from seasonality. Okay. So if you take log transform of this data, still seasonality still remains. Okay. So log transformation does not get rid of the seasonality. If we just take ACF, same, it does not solve our problem. We can see ACF is, is significant for several observations. Okay. If we take first differencing, okay. First differencing is just to get rid of the basic stationarity because the CVs in itself is increasing. Okay. So over a year, the earnings have increased. So first differencing should get rid of that problem. Okay. So even after that, this problem is not completely eradicated. Okay, so ACF is, uh, so what you observe now is that even now, there are significant lags, but there is a pattern to it. So what you observe for four is significant, eight is significant, both are in positive direction. One is significant, five is significant, but in negative direction. Same for uh, three over here. So three and seven are both significant, okay? So there is, there seems to be another seasonality. So if I again take difference, okay, but difference of order four, okay, so fourth order difference. So what happens when I take fourth order difference? Uh, what do I mean? So seasonality, in order to remove seasonality, what we do is that Y, say YT, it suffers from seasonality, okay? If it suffers from seasonality and your observations are quarterly, okay. So what we do here is that essentially we construct another series. Let's say that is XT, and we say this is YT minus YT minus four, okay. If that be so, this should get rid of the seasonal component, okay. And it's also possible that even after that, you remove the seasonality, but the data is, even after this, it is still non-stationary, then you need to do something like this, xt minus xt minus one, okay? So this is what we are doing for our data. So we are taking seasonal difference as well as regular difference. So here we have both regular difference as well as seasonal dependency, okay? Now you see this is much more manageable per se, okay? <laughs> Still not very clear, very obvious, but at least the ACF patterns are much better compared to your what you saw earlier, okay? So here we have uh, two sorts of differencing in our data, okay? You have seasonality and you also have uh, some sort of a trend component, okay? So what we do in such cases is that we try to fit in a model which gets rid of both this type, okay? So let me show you how we do that. And in, over there itself, I'll tell you how to forecast. So this is what you observe, right? So this is J and J data, Johnson and Johnson data. I'm just reading that data. I am plotting it. So this is time series yeah the time series of jnj quarterly earnings right now i take log transformation of the data and i plot it okay uh, The scale is different, that's all. Okay, so if I now look at the ACF, this is how what you saw. If I take it as the first difference ACF, uh, this is what you see. There is some clear pattern repeating after every four observation. If I just take four order four change, even then there is ACF, okay, both order one and two are significant. So I take both differences and, and try to see what happens. Okay, now uh, 
if I now try to do this after loading the Autovarima, it says that this particular data has, has drift. Okay, and this is the best fitted model, which has AIC of 225, and uh, these are the parameters. Okay, now, as of now, let me not concentrate on uh, whether this is the best fitted model. You can tweak around, play around with these parameters and see if you can find a better fitted model, but forget about that, okay? So this is my fitted j, &J model, okay? Johnson & Johnson, uh, okay? Now, what I'm doing over here is that I am storing this in a fit, okay? So, and I'm going to use it. So this is what I do. So this is if you do just by auto arima function. Instead, if you want to have a more proper model, okay, which which includes this seasonality as you have currently as you have currently identified, okay. So there are now two things working in a multiplicative form. You have a regular process multiplied by a seasonal process okay so what is going to happen is that they are going to overlap each other okay if that happens this is how you observe so your regular process this was a first difference model okay so all you are trying to do is that now you have a p d q regular process and a seasonal process which has order pdq but these two are present in a multiplicative form so what you estimate try to do is that you try to estimate these two separately okay so this order you determine this is of the order one first difference in this one gets you rid of your problem and this one right now we'll see what happens to it okay Let's say this one is also one, okay? So now what you need to do is that tweak with these numbers, okay? And the difference of it is four. That means you need to take a fourth order difference to get rid of the seasonal component, okay? So these are all the things you need to specify in your model, okay? I, I understand this, this does not seem very easy. It's not easy. But once you start doing it, it will give you first further intuitions into this data. Okay. Don't get worried. Try it out yourself and you will find that this, this all makes sense. So what we are doing is that we are trying to fit an ARIMA model. Okay. The regular ones, I am saying that let that be an AR process. Okay. AR process with first differencing, no MA component. The second one also saying this is a seasonal component. Okay. And the differencing I took was quarterly, right? So every four. So if I try to fit this in, this is the fitted model and you find your AIC is 102.16, okay? Now if I do it again, just by tweaking this parameter. So what I did over here is that I removed this differencing over here, okay? If I just change it, I see AIC, it has increased. So this model, this model is First model is better, second model is not better, okay? So first differencing in the, in the regular component makes it better, okay? So is it possible that it actually doesn't follow an AR process but instead follows an MA process? So I keep all of this same and see what happens if I run this again. So it says AIC reduces even further, okay? From 100 to this is 100. Okay. So that will be zero one one uh, list order equal. To. Which one? So list order equal to C zero one one. For the first parameter you are saying. Yeah. So that is zero one one in the seasonal part. That would be zero one one. Yeah, I'm just showing you how how my changes. Right. I'll, I'll change it. Don't so. We started with the assumption that these were AR process. Now you are saying that both of these, 
the seasonal mm -hmm. as well as the regular, both are AV processes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So even now you see that both AMA, that's also AIC is 100.7. So not too much of a difference over here. If you change it to a seasonal from an AR process to an AV process, but as of now, you can tweak the numbers mm -hmm. further. Okay. To, to have some sort of a prediction. Okay. But let's say this is our fitted model as of now. Okay. So there's a regular component. There is a fitted model. Both of these uh, are, both of these are AMA processes. Okay. And I store it in a, in a variable, which is fit. Okay. Now I'm trying to forecast. Forecast object is going to be fit. Okay. Now I need to specify H equals to, if I do this, this is trying to forecast the following values. Okay. Standing right now. So you had 84 observations in your data. Standing in the 84th observation, if you try to predict the future four values based on this fitted model, these are the fitted values. Okay. It tells you the forecasted values and the confidence intervals. Okay. If you plot it, you can see how it looks like. So if, if I, if I put it as uh, forecasted, and I store it and plot it in forecast. So based on these observations, these four are the four following forecasted values. Is this clear? I can possibly make this type because this is a bit crude, but uh, serves the purpose as of now. Are you able to see these forecasted values? Okay. Any observations you have? So all we did was that we stored these values. Okay. We, we stored, we found, figured out if this data has any seasonality. Please understand seasonality is not the easiest thing to understand. Okay. I provide you some for, I would ideally like to, you know, give you some further inputs regarding seasonality. As of now, I don't have time to talk to you regarding that, but I'll upload some more material. Go through that. If you have any further doubts regarding how to estimate a seasonal model, definitely get back to me and you won't be evaluated based on that. But this is something that is applicable not just for seasonal model, but for all of your AR models. Okay. What you essentially are doing is that figuring out which model fits best based on the AIC criteria. We are determining the order of the model. Once you have figured out the order of the model, then this is what you do. You try to forecast the future values based on that. It clearly gives, does a good enough job. So what you see here based on this data is actually pretty evident. So if let's say this slump, though it's not very clearly observable, let's say this slump happens in quarter one every year. Okay. So we had data till quarter one, then quarter two, there is a rise, which is similar to what you observe in all the, of the past data as well. Then there is a slump, which you see over here, quarter two to quarter three, there's a slump, but small slump, then again, a rise in quarter four and again, again, it's plummeting to quarter one. Okay. If you, what will happen if I wanted to show you one more thing, uh, let's say what happens if instead I put in this, I try to forecast 20 period ahead. Okay. What will happen?
Yeah. So what do you observe from here? Tell me. This is going, going to be our last discussion. What do you observe from this data? From, from this particular plot? What insights can you draw? What are these? This blue line is the forecasted part, right? The blue line is the is the forecasted values. This seems to follow some sort of a fixed pattern. What happens with the gray thing? Gray thing is basically your confidence interval, right? So what does it mean by confidence interval? Is basically some sort of an indicate. So confidence interval band that becomes increasing. Okay. So why why would confidence interval band increase? That will happen if the mean remaining same. Your variance increases. Okay. So your variance of so so as you go further from your data, the your your error variance increases. So though the mean remains same, you are less confident whether it will be within that range or not. Right. But it does decent enough job of, of prediction. So what you need to do for your project will be based on this. Um, yeah. Any any queries you have regarding whatever we have discussed? Any any overall queries regarding whatever we have covered in the Arima discussions? So I'm going to upload the material today. Okay. Uh, possibly not. Okay. I'll do it today. Whatever I had. Do you have a test for seasonality for our assignment? Uh, see, if I ask you, I, I haven't decided per se, but if I do ask you to test for seasonality, I'll give you detailed instruction regarding how to test for that seasonality. Okay. Does that make sense? If I ask you to do test for seasonality, I'll give you sufficient material to at, or at least some sort of a process flow to test for it and how to make inferences based on that. Okay. Okay. Any further queries? Is this all making sense or is it still becoming, you know, too, too much technical for your understanding? Now, does it all seem to serve any purpose or not? Okay. So, Vineet, thank you. For others. So, one request also yes. like, yes. if you like uh, show it on R more, then it would be better because, like, I've I was not able to understand few things in the previous classes, but when you show it on today on the R, mm -hmm. uh, so I could understand better. Yeah. What happens, you know, if I keep on switching between R and presentation, my flow also gets interrupted at certain times, but definitely that's something that I would, uh, second thing is, okay. Okay. Let, let me try that for my future classes. Okay. Let me try that for my future. So you are saying that, uh, in during class, if I show more things in the R console or in the R window and, and talk from whatever we observe over there, it becomes easier for you to understand. Yes, sir. Okay. Is, is this the same observation for others also? Are others having similar observations also or, or you have any? Okay. So then I'll do two things. Uh, what happens is that when I put the R codes in your slides with the output, you have the entire picture. Okay. So what I will do is that when I'm using in class, I would use the slides only for the theoretical inputs for everything else. I'm going to do it in R so that it becomes more meaningful. Okay. But the presentation I'm going to share is going to have both as in your slides in itself will be having the codes that you see right now. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. So I am going to work with the R script now on. That's that's how am I am I going to show you the examples. Okay. But 
the presentation i share with you is going to have that r script inbuilt okay with the outputs being shown at every step otherwise you you for for you to come back you need the recorded lecture to see how it happened or you need to memorize all of these things if you have it all in the slides i think it would be easier for you to understand okay so i'll i'll do that from from the next topic onwards okay any other any other observations so right now what i understand is uh, you you guys may have some sort of a difficulty in grasping the totality of this because we lot, did a lot uh, throughout this ar process this arima process so what i'm going to do is that i'm going to give you some sort of a you can it's not exactly a process for a diagram but something of that sort something which will tell you step by step what to do and for details you can always refer back to slides okay some sort of a overall step by step instruction what to do what to test for details refer to your your material but that will tell you every time you are doing a time series analysis what all are basic steps that you need to follow one after other okay and i hope you will be following those set of instructions for your uh, assignments and all sorts of submissions is that does that sound fine so it's basically saying something like this so i'll tell you first test this then test this if this happens you need to do this test if it doesn't happen then proceed to this one that way it will give you some sort of a process flow how to come out at the order itself okay i'll do that i'll upload it and uh, i'll keep your feedbacks in mind okay if you have any further feedbacks any further queries please feel free to write back to me we'll meet again on wednesday okay Stay safe, guys, and uh, see you on Wednesday. Thank you.